It's Conduit News Radio with Paul Harrell. I want to welcome back to the program. We have uh, Mr. Hunter Rivet is on the line this morning. Hunter, how you doing? Good morning, Paul. How are you? I'm doing good. Did you have a good Thanksgiving, sir? I had a great one. How about y'all? Yeah, we did very we did very well. The turkey turned out good, so I was happy. I was happy about that. Um, this uh, segment brought to you by Conduit for Commerce. They're putting Arkansas small business first. You can go to conduitforcommerce.org for more information. Uh, and look into uh, giving your tax-deductible donation to a group that's uh, standing up for small business. Um, in this week's Conduit for Commerce policy segment, uh, Hunter, we're talking about federalism, if you can save it. Now, in this uh, piece that I have in front of me, you, you talk about new federalism um, and how states can uh, slowly or how states have slowly lost their rights in the way to gain them back. What's neo-federalism to you, Hunter? Neo-federalism is the predominant idea to many statists today that states um, follow the will of the federal government in all matters and that money uh, and funds are the characteristic to push the state in the direction of Washington, D.C., hmm. to their dictation win. So, um, how, and how is that different uh, than what than the way the way it should be, you know how the framers established the federalist system. Well, it's entirely antithetical to the way in which this country was founded. So, even from the very beginning, with the Articles of Confederation during the Declaration and the Declaration of Independence, it, our union was made up of sovereign states who decided to give up some of that sovereignty, namely for common defense. And the only unitary government uh, there was under the Articles was that was their main power to provide a common defense. And even the Constitution, which gives more power to a unitary government than the Articles did, left such great power, uh, left such great power and sovereignty, especially with the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, specifically the Tenth, to the state. So we veered so far away from the original idea of federalism, which is uh, dual separated federalism. That is, states have totally different powers than the federal government. So today we have this mesh, this melded, this neo-federalism, and where they share powers, but ultimately when you when you share them like that, the federal government will have more power. Yeah, so uh, during the, I'm reading from this, uh, during the days of the colonies, the Englishmen on American soil saw their Virginia and or New York as sovereign and ultimate. It was these individual sovereign entities that willingly ceded some power to a national unitary government, not the other way around. So we're, we're kind of, most people today, I mean, it is the other way around, right? It's the federal government that created the states. That is how they view it. And, um, I will never forget, this would have been when Curtis Coleman was running against Asa uh, Hutchison in the Republican primary. Uh, I, sp I spoke with him, and he told me, you know, Hunter, the states made the federal government, not the other way around. And I was younger then, and it just made total sense. I, I do not understand how, in our current uh, education system, this is totally being bypassed. No, that's true. That's true. It, it really is. Um this part is interesting. Talk a little bit about this because this totally exposes the modern day interpretation of uh, the First Amendment as being inconsistent with what the founding the founding fathers uh, uh, did. The, the framers, when they constructed, um, they were masters of their own domain, meaning the states. For example, many states had a state-sanctioned church or denomination. All but Rhode Island required Trinitarian beliefs in order to hold public office. With the passing of the First Amendment, the Congress was restricted from establishing a national church, but left the states free to do what they wanted. Now, that is, um, that is completely contrary to what many people believe today. Right. This would blow the head, blow the mind of, you know, our current, are today our neoliberals and our statists, uh, that states would um, 
under the Constitution be able to sanction a state church, which I'm not necessarily saying I support. Me I think neither, yeah. I'm taking a Jeffersonian viewpoint to that. Remember, Thomas Jefferson, he considered one of his greatest accomplishments the Virginia uh, Declaration of, uh, you know, in fighting for uh, separation of church and state. However, you cannot construe under a clear reading of the First Amendment that states don't have that power. It says Congress shall make no law. It says nothing about the state. Mm -hmm. And so probably one of the most important and most unconstitutional Supreme Court dictate is Engel versus Vitale, which, it, uh, which in what lawyers and uh, jur you know, jurists call um, incorporated the First Amendment upon the state. Well, incorporation has no constitutional basis. That, that, that means that the First Amendment, it now must apply to all state law as well. And it is not written like that. And um, every um, anti-federalist who, you know, was in support of these amendments never wanted it to be construed in that way. Hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's it really is. It, it, what 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 we're basically showing here, in my opinion, is the states uh, themselves. They used to be much more free than they are today. Now, one of the reasons, and you point out the biggest reason that they're not, is because the federal government has uh, continually, um, they've continually uh, uh, lost their sovereignty because you get these, uh, I'm sorry, the state, the states have continued to lost their sovereignty because you get these federal funds um, that you get in, in return. They come at a cost, right? Um, talk a little bit about that. Talk about the strings that are attached. The strings that are attached are entirely monetary. So as long as we have a policy of people who believe that they have a, a freedom, they have a liberty, they have a right to health care, a right to food, a right to water, then the state, of course, must raise its revenue and attempt to provide these rights, these so-called rights. So as long as we have a people who believe that the state gives them everything they want, the state is going to take that and run with it, and that's what that costs money. So we've only seen state and local government increase taxes. We've only seen the federal government increase its taxes until very recently. Um, and and this money is being pushed back um, into states. They think they're getting their money back, but it's all in the guise of neo-federalism. So they say, we'll give you a couple billion dollars in grants as long as you regulate water the way we want. They say, okay, at least we're getting the money back. We'll regulate the water how we want. Well, that's not, that's a total a total perversion of the sovereignty of states to regulate the environment, which is totally protected under the Constitution, or the freedom of speech. They'll, you know, they'll say, we will give you a couple billion dollars in grants if you say that um, the drinking age is 21 and or over. But there's nothing in the Constitution that protects that. It's totally unconstitutional. And unfortunately, we do not have people who are standing up to the federal government and saying, actually, we as a state can decide that. We don't need your money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I would I would add there because the first thing that comes into my mind is you know how in the world did the federal government get so rich? And I really think it comes down to you know the big swing was the federal income tax. I mean, it was a it was a huge wall that was kind. Of, there used to be a barrier between the individual and the federal government, um, and and you were more. You know, you were more familiar with your state. And so, you know, when they collected taxes from people, they weren't they were collecting taxes from the states, not the people before the federal income tax. Correct, Hunter? I mean, they were basically right. uh, saying, Arkansas, you owe this much because you got this many people in Arkansas. It was left left up to Arkansas as how they want to collect that from their people to, to send what they need to send to fund the federal government. But once they got that federal income tax in, I mean, it, it's just been um, more and more and more money for them. Right. Uh, the only other time before that was during the War of Northern Aggression. Uh, but actually, both governments had a unitary federal system of taxes and tariffs. And Karl Marx actually applauded Lincoln's um, attempt to uh, have a progressive income tax. And uh, so uh, Woodrow Wilson and uh, proponents during the year, it wasn't just him, uh, said that this would be one of the best ways to uh, feed the federal government money. 
and create a new uh, class system based off of the progressive income tax. So, and before that, the really the only federal interference someone would have was with the post postman. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. A way, and 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 that's one of the things. That, I mean, that's one of the reasons that that the you know the post office. Uh, you know, having a, a unitary government, you know, so you, you know about, uh, uh, you know, certain uh, uh, the same m uh, measurement standards and, and that sort of thing. You know what I mean? Like just to have some sort of I mean, that's that's as really as loose as the union was supposed to be initially. And obviously, we're right. We're, and that was an enumerated power that Congress would have the ability to fund and maintain both growth. Mm -hmm. OK, that's in the Constitution. But now we're talking about things that are not even. There's not even a penumbra of, you know, ideation in the Constitution to uh, regulate uh, ponds and regulate um, who can drink this or regulate this, that, and the other thing just so states can get back their money. We've totally gone away from this idea of strict, uh, divisive federalism. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you also write, I thought this was interesting, um, we do think about the genius of our framers uh, when they divide our government into three branches, okay, legislative, executive, judicial, because they knew that power concentrated in, in one institution would be bad, so let's have, you know, let's have more institutions that are separate and equal, but you write that the founders went even further because they split the responsibilities and power between Washington, D.C. and the states as well. And that um, is what we're talking about. We have s severely lost here. Absolutely. So today there is a revert back to, and it's incredibly, I think it's incredibly scary. We must take note of it. Scary is the wrong word. It's terrifying. There is this notion that Plato and his idea of a philosopher team, which was really in vogue during the medieval and uh, these eras of these despots, which was really in vogue then, um, that they think that's the way to go. We need a philosopher king to rule over us totally, which is totally opposed to the ideas that the West is founded on today. Uh, Aristotle's idea of a mixed regime, where you have elements of democracy. You do have elements of monarchy, but they're balanced out with each other in what we call a republic. So um, there is this terrifying idea that we need someone who's an elite, to someone who's much smarter, to rule over us. And we are um, currently, we have a generation who's saying, you know what, our founding fathers who thought of this federalist system, they were just racist white men who wanted to control power. That's why they made it like this. No, that's not at all true. They actually wanted to keep power in the hands of the people. I, I, yeah, you're exactly right. Um, talk about the Tenth Amendment. Uh, you're right. It's hard to know where we are headed. State governments and courts are turning more and more to the Tenth Amendment. What do you mean by that? Quite simply, the Tenth Amendment says that powers not specifically enumerated to and through the Constitution to the federal government are reserved to the people and the states. So, whenever you take a um, uh, whenever you take a case to court, say a farmer is having his pond regulated by an EPA agent from Washington D.C., you take it to court, and the judge says, "Hold on." This whole thing is unconstitutional because of the Tenth Amendment. The Constitution does not give the federal government the right to regulate small ponds. It doesn't give the, um, the Constitution the right to regulate religious speech in states. And so they just say this whole case is humbug because of the Tenth Amendment. And increasingly, we, increasingly we're seeing constitutionalists and libertarians and conservative judges say, this whole case is thrown out because this is unconstitutional, and increasingly it's headed up to the Supreme yeah. Court. Yeah, well, um, I, I, I certainly, yeah, I hope that's happening. I know, uh, you know, the president right now is uh, nominating a, and getting a lot of judges confirmed, and um, I know there that's basically going to stop now between now and the end of the year because of you know Jeff Flake uh, and doing what he's doing, but. It is encouraging, you know, getting uh, uh, conservative justices and judges, I guess, is uh, going to really help things, I think, moving forward. That may, in fact, be President Trump's biggest accomplishment when it's all said and done. It's not just the Supreme Court, but uh, all of these lower courts as well. Um, uh, Hunter, I'll, I'll give you the last word. Um, we are seeing record uh, number of judges appointed to district and appellate courts. Uh, President Trump will probably get several more Supreme Court appointments. So let us uh, hope and pray that they 
that he stays true to the libertarian ideas uh, enshrined in people like Neil Gorsuch, and that we continue as a uh, country and as a people and as students of the Constitution to keep in mind the ideas of federalism and the Tenth Amendment and separation of powers between the state and the federal government. Yeah. Hunter Rivett, I appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. Thanks, Paul. All right.